school uh, is detained for uh, family reasons and senses of politics to children who can't unfortunately be the last minute um, last minute family reasons. So we have um, a paper by Professor Hinchka and another paper followed by a paper by Professor Cross. We're going to take the two papers consecutively and then have questions at the end. That's how the speakers prefer to organise things. We have speakers of coming from different disciplines but united by um, training and interest in history. Um, Jens is obviously going to be talking about Latin America, being from the SPAS department, and Moira is talking about uh, Flora Tristan, famous figure of politics and literature in France, but also ramifications of the, the history and transmission of the Tristan uh, myth, perhaps we could call it, um, worldwide. So without more further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Jens. <coughs> this is not the emergency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, if we say in general that in Latin America, uh, in contrast to North America and uh, Western Europe, uh, state formation preceded nation building, then this is especially true for the Oriental Republic of Uruguay, <coughs> a notorious uh, 19th century um, trouble spot, theater of war uh, with external and internal fronts often uh, overlapping. And uh, the country was really only uh, uh, pacified in 1903-04 uh, after a last uh, armed uh, party political conflict and then became Latin America's first worker state democracy. An astonishing uh, transformation which is uh, closely associated with the name of Jose Valle y Oregonias and uh, his followers, the Young Turks in the uh, Colorado party, uh, essentially a liberal party uh, called the Vajistas. Uh, now, recent historiography has begun to show that actually uh, the Vajistas could build upon previous uh, policy formation after the uh, Paraguayan War under the military regimes, especially of Lorenzo La Torre, and, uh, but also to a lesser extent his successors. The army had come out of the uh, Paraguayan War in 1865-70, uh, 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 strengthened, and um, then uh, essentially uh, imposed an orderly peace and legal codes. It uh, provided um, services and financial stability and allowed for an economic and uh, political uh, modernization of uh, Uruguay. <coughs> and part of this um, reform process was the full reform of the brothers uh, Jose Pedro and Jacobo uh, Varela, uh, who again followed the example of the Argentinian uh, teacher president Domingo Pastino Sarmiento. Um, the purpose of this reform was uh, twofold. On the one hand, the Varelas wanted to uh, complement this process of uh, political centralization with um, the related um, cultural nation building. On the other, Uruguay was to find, to find access to the uh, expanding capitalist uh, world market and attract uh, immigrant labor. So public schools became sites to uh, generate uh, national allegiance in future citizens. And uh, discipline the workforce. Um, if we look at textbooks in history, geography, and civic and moral education, they give us a very good uh, idea of what uh, images of Uruguay the country wanted to inculcate in children. Um, <coughs> Uruguay was depicted as white, erasing from public memory uh, the Amerindian legacy, as urban cosmopolitan. The Varelas also um, tried to find the so called letter city or the letrados of the uh, intellectual elite. Um, <coughs> so, but essentially, pitting um, the city against uh, the country. And uh, finally, uh, the country was represented as secularly 
educated. Now, none of these uh, representations of national identity was really uh, uncontested, but I want to argue that nothing was more, um, um, of course, more debates, at least at the beginning, than the excavation of uh, Jose Artigas, the leader of an anti-colonial and uh, autonomous uh, movement, and his integration into uh, a foundation narrative. And I want to now take you through the very complex uh, independence revolution in uh, Uruguay. Otherwise, I think the textbook representation would not be um, easily understandable. It's, um, it's really probably the most complex process uh, in Latin America. Uh, at the end of the colonial period, the Uruguay was called the Banda Oriental, which means nothing but the Eastern Bank and relates to the Uruguay River, which still today forms the western uh, border of uh, uh, Uruguay, the border to Argentina. And together with uh, Paraguay, still smaller then, and Upper Peru, now Bolivia, the Banda belonged to the Spanish vice royalty of River Plate, which had only been founded in the mid 18th century as part of the Bourbon reforms to get a firmer grip at this form of periphery of the Spanish uh, Empire. Um, in the administrative center, the vice royalty in Buenos Aires, um, the Creoles, the colonial uh, upper class, uh, gained independence from Spain, at least de facto, as early as May 1810, leaving Montevideo, the port, uh, rival port city across the River Plate, as the only stronghold of royalists. And it was, a, it was in this situation that uh, Artigas um, mobilized the population, the especially rural population, uh, for a guerrilla campaign, which would last for nine years until 1820. In the first phase, until 1813, he joined forces with the Revolutionary Supreme Directory in Buenos Aires, uh, which allowed them to um, inflict uh, an early defeat to the Spanish in the Battle of Las Piedras, but it proved to be a very victory. Now the Viceroy of Montevideo called the Portuguese into the country, invited them to invade, and so they did. Uh, Buenos Aires had other uh, trouble at home, and then negotiated against Artigas as well um, an armistice. As a consequence, the Portuguese troops withdrew, Buenos Aires withdrew, but what was unexpected was that Artigas crossed the Uruguay River into Entre Rios, the province of, of the United Provinces of future Argentina, between the rivers, Uruguay and Paraná River. And he took with him four-fifths of the population, the so-called exodus of the Oriental people. Now, in 1813, Buenos Aires convoked a constituent assembly, and it made very clear that it wanted to build a centralist state. Uh, Artigas responded by convening um, a congress in uh, Tres Cruces. Uh, delegates from the Constitutional were elected, and he gave them his famous instructions, instructions how they were to vote. And this is now his state building project um, uh, for complete independence from Spain, but at the same time, uh, he wanted to create a, a republican confederation. Uh, this was, of course, uh, conflicting with Buenos Aires' centralism or unitarianism. And so his delegates were not even uh, received in Buenos Aires, hitting Artigas now not just against the Spanish, but also Buenos Aires. Um, so, just one year later, in 1814, the Spanish were expelled from Montevideo. But a year later, Artigas took the entire Banda Oriental and uh, now uh, he, um, created his uh, famous Federal League or League of the Free <coughs> People, the red area on the upper map. Stretching from the Atlantic into the heartland of the United Provinces to Cordoba, leaving Buenos Aires quite isolated from the rest of the country. So, um, in 1816, the Portuguese sent for a second time troops from Brazil and occupied the Banda Oriental for 
um, a period of 12 years. Um, and Buenos Aires remained quite complicit in this situation. Artigas continued to uh, resist until 1820, but then uh, was betrayed and withdrew to Paraguay, where he died in 1850, and didn't even accept the invitation of the uh, government uh, to return. But this was not the end of the independence struggle. Um, the Portuguese converted the Banda Oriental into their southernmost, uh, into the southernmost uh, <coughs> province of Brazil, Cisplatina. When in uh, uh, 1822 Brazil gained independence <coughs> from Portugal, uh, the new country did not withdraw troops from Cisplatina. So in 1825, 33 Orientals emigres in Buenos Aires um, started a crusade to reconquer the Banda uh, under the leadership of Juan Antonio Lavalleja. Um, they forced the uh, Brazilian troops to retreat to up Greater Montevideo. And in the liberated areas, um, an assembly took place, the Assembly of Florida, on the 25th of August. And it declared, and this is important, independence from Brazil, but a return into the United Provinces, into the later Argentina. Um, each, yeah, and there were no conditions, no instructions this time. It was an unconditional return. Buenos Aires, of course, still wanted control over uh, the Banda. The Portuguese did not accept that, which had more on Argentina, and uh, this could only be uh, prevented by British diplomatic intervention. In 1828, Britain uh, brought the two sides together, and um, as the preliminary peace was signed, it created the independent buffer state of the Oriental Republic of Uruguay, with La Valleja becoming the first um, governor. Two years later, the country gave itself a constitution on the 18th of July, 1830, and the first president became Rivera. The two founded the two parties, the Blancos, later the Nationalists, the, or Conservative Party, and the Colorados, or the Liberals. And they would then fight each other for the next decades. Argentina did not give up its hegemonic ambitions. It dreamed of restoring the boundaries of the old royalty until the first decade of the 20th century. We still find it in Stanislaus Serrano's uh, foreign policy, um, and Brazil didn't give up uh, the dream of having a southern uh, Latin border. It still needed to send actually its fleet to Buenos Aires and then up the Paraná River to get into the uh, remote areas in Boyasha and the Black World. So, this was the backdrop for the whole discussion which then developed under the military. Um, I mean, for a country which ultimately owed its existence to British diplomatic intervention, it would, of course, be very difficult to construct a national pantheon um, which could unify and energize the nation. Uh, Uruguay lacked a relatively undisputed liberator, as with Simon Bolivar, uh, the, um, in the successive states. Not so much. No. <laughs> in the successive states of uh, Great Colombia, um, Venezuela, Colombia, and to an extent uh, Ecuador, um, it didn't have a shared political philosophy as with the American creed in the United States, the ideology of the founding fathers. So, in their search for such national heroes, the military uh, regime rediscovered Artigas and linked him in a quite arbitrary way with both La Valleja and Rivera, so we couldn't stand both of them. If we look at textbooks, then until about 1840, uh, Artigas was painted in a rather positive way, but only changed with Argentina's uh, national reconstruction in the writings of uh, two later presidents, uh, Domingo Pacino Sarmiento and Pablo Mitre, uh, especially in um, Sarmiento's work, um, where nation building in the River Plate was represented as an epic battle between civilization 
as represented by Europeanized uh, Buenos Aires, and uh, barbarism as personified by the rural gauchos. And this social Darwinist interpretation found access to textbooks in, in Argentina, uh, which also circulated north of the River Plate in Uruguay. There were not many textbooks until the 1870s. Um, and still today, <coughs> you find sometimes in Argentinian textbooks that uh, when Artigas spoke the Spanish and Portuguese, he appeared to be an Argentinian nationalist. When he stood up against Buenos Aires, he became suddenly a barbaric, uh, destructive uh, Caudillo. Um, and this came to the interests of those in uh, Uruguay who, as late as 1879, still thought of maybe um, a merger of Uruguay with Argentina on an equal basis, but still. Um, the Barreras realized the, the weakness of Uruguay's frontier society and the need for building a, an imagined community. And so they tried to correct this black legend surrounding Artigas. But it proved to be a very conflictive um, story, um, as the case of um, Positivist Terezo, who was a close collaborator of the Barreras, Francisco Berra showed. Berra published an Ebosquejo Historico de la República Oriental del Uruguay, or a historical uh, synthesis or outline of uh, European history. The first two editions <coughs> followed noteworthy, but the third edition, which appeared in uh, 1882, uh, led to conflicts. It depicted uh, Artigas as uh, the representative of indigenous uh, barbarism. And uh, his colleague, um, fellow reformer, Carlos Maria Ramirez, um, um, essentially said that uh, um, Berra failed to recognize that barbarian attacks at the Roman Empire had actually uh, given birth to Christian civilization as the attacks of the, of the Caudillos in Argentina uh, contributed to the prosperity of Buenos Aires. He said, literally, um, Artigas was not the founder of the Uruguayan nation, but, I quote, the initiator and precursor of the social decompositions that would transform the atrophied authorities of a vast colonial empire into a federative, lasting, and insecurable democracy. He is the first who enrolled and unified the rural masses of the river plate. Uh, behind the banner of revolution. The first who fought them to fight and die for an idea in this heroic battle of Las Piedras, which the Argentinian anthem commemorates, and which is an indisputable glory of Artigas. Barrow um, defended himself, but um, to no avail. In 1883, the textbook was uh, banned from all schools, and teachers were advised not to discuss with children um, alternative conflicting interpretations of independence, uh, children would still lack uh, reflexive criteria. Uh, they needed rather noble inspirations. <coughs> and while this debate was going on, Francisco Bauza, uh, a Catholic intellectual whose father had fought alongside Artigas, uh, published his famous uh, Historia de la Dominación Española en el Uruguay the uh, history of the Spanish domination of Uruguay, and this pioneered uh, a religious uh, historiography. And uh, his interpretation found access to many textbooks. In one of them we read, uh, the evaluation, sorry, some writers, uh, mainly Argentinians, say that Artigas was an ignoring gaucho, a cruel, ferocious, and bloodthirsty barbarian. Other writers, mainly Orientalists, consider him to be quite educated for his time, with noble feeling, an independent character, a great patriot, reckless and courageous to the degree of heroism. The truth is that even the most impartial and well-intentioned Argentinians cannot see it as what lies the man who fought against them, and was the main reason that today the Banda Oriental does not belong to the Argentine Republic. Orientalism term must do their best to prove that their compatriot Artigas was a man of superior quality. Um, this is actually interesting for both what it says and what it omits. Um, Artigas was celebrated for his decisive stance of the national question um, uh, against Argentina, which as such did not even 
exist before 1862. It's still the United Republic. Um, but textbooks said nothing about the federal elite, nor about the secret of Artigas' success or the, the social problem. Um, Artigas' career campaign also represented a social revolution. He aimed at an agrarian democracy. He wanted to give, well, he gave actually, land to his followers to marginalize rural elements, um, converted them um, into smallholders, and actually independent of uh, skin color, and later he wanted to give them political participation. And actually this meant that uh, the hacendados, the landowners, uh, but also the lettered city, Montevideo, feared him. Uh, they face now a threat to their social position, their, to their economic monopolies, and therefore often made common cause with Buenos Aires, and like Buenos Aires, even with the Portuguese, so they facilitated this process of the conversion of the Banda Oriental into um, the uh, province of Cisplatina. There is similar silence with regard to the Assembly of Florida's decision to return into the United Provinces. Um, if we look um, at the oeuvre of Orestes Araujo, the most prominent and prolific textbook writer of the fin de siècle, uh, he depicted the 1830 constitution as a contract between free people and as a direct consequence of the 1825 Assembly which was now stylized as the Premier Congreso Patrio, the uh, first Congress of the Fatherland, the uh, Uruguayan Congress. So in other words, the oath of the 33 Orientals, immortalized by this famous painting by Juan Manuel Blanes, which you can also find in textbooks, uh, found its ratification in the Constitution Oath of 1830. Um, so, by converting the patriots of 1825 into combatants against both Brazil, which they were, and Argentina, which they clearly were, and extending their campaign until 1828, the Declaration of Independence, it was possible to link them with Artigas the Independentista, which he wasn't, but how textbooks represented him. It also made it possible to commemorate uh, 25th of August as Independence Day. And this is still the case today, despite an intervention uh, five years ago by the former president, Julio Maria Sanguinetti. Uh, however, Artigas emerged as the precursor of the nationality, the Oriental nationality, not the father or founder of the nation, the Uruguayan nation, because this would allow the exclusion of the Federal League. Uh, as well as of all the renditions and betrayals that had taken place, they would now not become part of an undignified national history. So to close the frame, uh, when the Bajistas came to power, they imposed now a, a democratic polity, and reforms, social reforms, were no longer feared for uh, their explosive potential as a source of instability. So the the importance of Artigas as a symbol of national unity even further increased. In 1909, Eduardo Acevedo published his José Artigas, Jefe de los uh, Orientales y Protector de los Pueblos Libres, um, Artigas the uh, chief or commander of the Orientals and the protector of the free people, which now really made him a Bolivar-style liberator. And a project to erect a statue to him had existed since 1883, uh, and you see it here actually on a painting, uh, another painting by Blanes. And it came very close to how it looks now. Um, it was only in 1913 that the winner of an international competition, uh, Italian Angel Zanelli, was um, chosen, and it took another 10 years uh, to inaugurate the monument. All that changed is, if you look, uh, well, you would have to know one video, I think, here, um, he is still riding towards the old town, the colonial town, 
that was not beheaded. Huh? So now he writes towards the Rambla, the new uh, reconstructed uh, Montevideo. And if you look at him, uh, he appears as a noble gentleman sitting on a classicist horse um, in a contemplative mood, looking into uh, a glorious future. So the message was very clear. The Bajistas saw themselves as the party that implements Artigas' legacy. His sacrifice was not in vain. And in 1977, the military regime um, inaugurated a mausoleum beneath the monument, uh, which is nothing but a continuation of this um, foundation. get from one to the other. her statement, her policy statement, if you like, at the end of her life, 
à créer, messieurs, les salutations de celle qui est votre sœur en humanité, Spadatuans, Pura Christa. So this is the handwriting of uh, the woman I have spent the last 30 years with. So, uh, the, um, the, and there's another portrait of her before I go on, and just to show uh, that they've got the wrong date of her death there, the, uh, that's her, her, her daughter. Uh, that, and so that is a photograph, and her daughter is the mother of Gauguin. So there is, you can see the, the family likeness. But uh, Flora Tristan, morte à Bordeaux, le 14 novembre 1844, elle fut uh, uh, bien vivement, uh, uh, I can't remember what's written there, uh, but the, les, 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 elle est reconnue par les ouvriers qui ont, uh, pour lesquels elle a, elle a travaillé. Elle a, so her Immediately after her death, legends arose as the, uh, as the woman who um, uh, was uh, working for a cause. So the ha but this cause didn't die with her death. This cause is the cause of justice, it's the cause of human rights, it's the cause of uh, women and men, it's the cause against oppression. So these are the ideas that humanity uh, kind of transmits or, can, or, or interprets or uh, translates into policy uh, uh, second time in memorial and she was one actress she was one actress uh, in, in a very big story so uh, come on right okay so what I'm going to do is it sorry uh, yes sorry I'm, I'm jumping here the, the, the way I think of he's not as an electric current I'm going to do five A's uh, a is for amps, okay. So, but any, so you could do lots of games. But what I want to do is talk about her in several categories. A is for adventurer, which is what she was. A is for artist, which is what she was. A is for author, which is what she was. A is for activist. And then A is for acolytes and academics. So there are her disciples, the militants, and then the academics who do the work of day. So that's what I'm going to uh, talk about in this, uh, this afternoon. So uh, the. Um, the, I, I've done a sort of a spread of how she was a transmitter and transmission is absolutely essential to her um, first of all she, these are the types of her books so she wrote books but it's not just her as an author she uh, worked to create a, a, a workers union and she um, sorry I'll use this and I'll stop pointing she uh, wrote in the press she had, corresp she had correspondence she created a network uh, her correspondence is very important. I'm, I'm, I'm working on that at the moment. Um, she believed that her ideas should contain, um, have contributions, have uh, contributions to. She went around collecting funds. So connections with people was absolutely essential. Uh, another transmission of her idea was in a song contest. I've done a, a chapter on that. Uh, she actually ran, ran a song contest and got into big trouble with the songwriters and it caused. Uh, Mayhem, but uh, long before the Eurovision Song Contest, Flora Tristan was using that as a vehicle for transmitting her idea. Now, the, um, as I'll be talking about soon, her personal life, uh, the fact that she's the grandmother of Gauguin is almost irrelevant for the ideas, but yet she's, that's still part of the legacy, and it hasn't really been properly treated as far as I can see. Um, the, here the academic interest, the transmission of complex ideas, and again, I, I, what uh, Charles said this morning, the complexity of her ideas is what you know, took some time to be appreciated. I think that's, uh, that's uh, that in our uh, kind of um, post-modernist, post-structural, post-1989, uh, uh, possibly post-2011, uh, world, we have uh, we have a different way of looking at politics from uh, the time of her of her life. And uh, this what I call I call Florence a nomadic subject because people have taken interest in her in her in different times. And I, some of these circles are on top of one another. And here's an example of where the Fourierist, the Saint Simonian, all her contemporary socialists were much more important, much more significant, much more prolific. And uh, than she was, but somehow, uh, if I could have another uh, dimension to this slide, I would bring out her as an author, has come forward, that there are shifts in the importance of historic figures. 
Um, so we've got the, um, the militancy question, the people who are actually on the ground fighting for the, uh, these ideas, so there's a sort of a, a, a vertical transmission of these ideas through, um, through the kind of socialist world, which itself changed, uh, as I've shown a minute, and then academic questions, which also change, and the shape of academic uh, discussion on Islam has gone from her being an exceptional woman to uh, her being firmly embedded in women's history. So, uh, these are the. This doesn't work very well. Again, it's not transmitting. <laughs> <laughs> right, author. Um, now, one of the one of the striking things is that um, if you look at the dates of the first publications of Francis Christian's work, and then when they were republished, this gives the game away as to how interested people were in her. Uh, the, the, the main, um, she, she didn't, she wasn't a prolific writer if you compare to Georges Sand, who wrote uh, reams upon reams of novels and who left very well-organized correspondence. For, for one of the problems we have is that she very few sources, apart from her own. And so the, um, the main works were pr produced, she, she, she somehow got published, which is a, again uh, a, you know, an interesting question, how did she a relative nobody get published, get published. But the, um, if you look at your handout, I've given you uh, the, the, the dates of the original publications and then the dates of the re-editions, and they're all in the 1970s. That somehow there was a great big gap between of sort of the transmission of her works, the, you know, the circulation of her works, uh, shrank. Uh, uh, it has to be said that Union Frier sold more copies than the Communist Manifesto, or Proudhon's what is property. It's, it's so many thousands more. So if you put it in that context, uh, Communist Manifesto came out in 1848, her Union of Fier came out in 1843. So that's kind of a factor uh, you could play around with. Um, Promenade en Londres, which is a terrific look at um, the French Roman Act, uh, again, transnational um, a look at, of, of a French woman look, uh, visiting London, that came out in the 1840s and 1840 we published it shortly afterwards. It doesn't come out until 1978, and so it goes on. So there's the, the question of uh, her, the transmission, the knowledge of her works is a problem, as we, um, as we can imagine. No. Artists. Artists, stop at artists, please. <laughs> I think I'll just go back to the end. Old fashioned. Right, so the, as an artist, of course, when uh, Gauguin uh, is mentioned, uh, there are a lot of skeletons in the cupboard. It's not, we can't talk about a traditional kind of uh, family holding of papers. Flora Tristan's papers were completely scattered when she, was, when she died. And there, so uh, Gauguin's uh, grandfather, his grandmother was Flora uh, Tristan, his grandfather, her husband, tried to shoot her and was locked up for 17 years. And in fact, in transmission of the family knowledge, there is a whole corpus of the, the court papers. And Gauguin's um, grandfather wrote a memoir, his version of the story, uh, in, while he was in prison. So there, that is available, but not often brought out. So um, you've got, uh, there are, she has, she, she from Christian, uh, tr 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 controlled, very much controlled her own story. She was the creator of her, she was the transmitter almost of her own. Uh, self-aggrandizement of her own self-creation of her own identity because she destroyed the papers uh, of the times of her life which she didn't particularly care to remember. Um, so there's, you know, you can play around with that, the fact that she, she actually did uh, have a, a, a good, um, Shazal, her husband, had a, had a brother who was more, who was more uh, successful than uh, her, her, her ex-husband and um, the, uh, so the, and, and the fact that uh, she went to Peru, uh, uh, her daughter went to Peru afterwards. So Peru was, could have been the holder of the Flora Tristan legacy, but in fact when she brought out her book, book condemning the Peruvian society, condemning the class system, the Peruvians burned her books in public, and uh, then they are reclaiming, the Peruvians are now reclaiming at the end of the 20th century the identity um, as uh, Patricia knows well, um, the, the, the kind of the ancestry of uh, Florent Tristan. So when we had 
when, when this story is known, there is a lot to say. There's the fact that she you know, emerged from a personal difficult position where she was uh, technically had very little family backing. In fact, her parents never organized their marriage rights, so she's technically illegitimate. And she's certainly badly uh, off because of the ruling in France about divorce. There was no divorce allowed with the restoration of the monarchy, as people studying gender history and politics will know. And the, um, so therefore she was caught in the, in the situation where, the, the, like many couples, she uh, couldn't divorce. And so what, what she did do was then translate her, translate her uh, personal difficulties to um, a recognition that well, this is a collective, um, a collective uh, experience that, uh, and not only in France, not only in Peru, in London, where, in, in England, wherever she went. So she had, she, she moved, and this was great, um, if you like, uh, uh, material for, for, for feminist studies at the end of the 20th century when that developed. Now, here I put in, as an activist, she made the first call for a workers an international workers association and that's very important with, for what I'm coming up with uh, as, as, a, as a bone of contention or as a, as a, a transmitted legacy uh, the fact is that she uh, Fleur Christian's life came to an abrupt halt when she was on her tour of France transmitting her idea to become a reality uh, she died of illness and attended the revolution of the world her she didn't live in Bordeaux, she didn't have any time in Bordeaux. It was the Saint Simonians who welcomed her, um, who welcomed her as a, a federal socialist. And so her, the, uh, the, family, the, the family that, if you like, claims her most is the, is the, is the socialist family, is the, is the, um, are, are her acolytes. So uh, we have got the acolytes of the 19th century who are possibly different from uh, the 20th century. Um, the family affairs were completely disrupted with the, with the husband in jail. He actually died, uh, Shazad was released after 17 years in prison and died in his bed. Uh, Aline, who was a young girl when her mother died, uh, married Claude Scogan, who was a Republican journalist. And uh, at, when things got very hot during the Second Republic, Aline and uh, her husband, uh, Clovis, with her two small children, Paul and Matthew, decided to go to Peru um, to, uh, to claim the, sort of the family inheritance, because of course, Clovis's uh, father was Peruvian, so therefore Aline's grandfather was Peruvian, and uh, that, hence the, the, the um, Peruvian connection. So there is no family transmission, if you like, directly. But as I say, the disciples held her works for a surgeon, Eleonore Blanc in Lyon was uh, the one who kept her diary and her papers, which lay unpublished until 19... The diary has been published in 1973. I translated it uh, some years later. But if you like, the, the correspondence that, uh, that she received is uh, still being handled uh, by me and has yet it to be uh, fully exploited. So that was one. So these... Eleanor Blanc and her family kept these papers and miraculously... Uh, real, the real hero of the story is called Jean Fresh, uh, find them, and I'm trying to find out at, at what stage he found them. Uh, this is about 1908, he found them. And he persuaded the family to hand them over. Uh, now, there are, th the certain, there are certain political turns of events which happen which go against the memory of Florent Tristan, so I'll quickly go through them. That, for instance, Florent Tristan. I did not live to see the sort of the 1848 revolution, which demanded the right to vote. It certainly demanded the right to work, which is what she had done. So, if you like, as soon as feminist ideas and socialist ideas were repressed, uh, Republicans refused to consider the question of divorce. Um, so, the, the, if you like, this is where memory or transmission is uh, it becomes memory becomes forgetting, and transmission stops. Uh, so the, uh, the utopian socialists that Florent Tristan was associated of course were overtaken by Marx who then uh, pushed scientific Marxism and that has a big um, part to play in the explanation of how Florent Tristan is remembered so what I'm looking at is the complexity of the way Florent Tristan's works were conveyed 
and the, they, they, they weave through, they transmit it through uh, the network of reformist and revolutionary battles. The French socialists uh, uh, grouped around uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, and in fact Proudhon and Marx became enemies uh, in, in the first international. And so, if you like, she becomes a victim of these uh, of the of the transmission of the transformation of the socialism from Utopia to Marxism, and we can talk about that later. But the um, there are other events which happen, uh, and there are other networks which, for me, have been too hidden. I think uh, the, she, her 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 books were transmitted, her ideas were transmitted. She was mentioned, and I'm finding this more and more uh, in these marginal circles where pacifists, feminists, syndicalists, and suffragists. Uh, moved around. They were radical, but they were, if you like, less visible than the prominent, uh, prominent, uh, uh, if you like, reformer politicians who went to the socialists who went to, to into Parliament, or the uh, socialists who devoted their time to trade unions. So this is where uh, the story really starts for me at the moment. Uh, you can have memories of, uh, if you like, commemorations uh, at strong political moments. Or anniversaries, and that's that's very uh, typical profile. I found uh, more articles around 1919 when they were debating the suffrage And even though Fernand Christian wasn't particularly keen on the right to vote, somehow the Senate even uttered her name when they were talking about the women's uh, right to vote. In 1936, not surprisingly, with the first victory of a, an overall majority of the Front Populaire, there were many articles. Uh, the centenary of her death, very little. Well, you can imagine 1944 wasn't exactly the best time. Uh, in, in I, I still have to get to the bottom of you know, to what extent anybody talked about her. But there are very few articles around it. There are, there, are, there are one or two in the centenary of the Second Republic. And from the 1970s, then, of course, she uh, talked about as la grande mère de, uh, not du Gauguin, but du socialisme, la grande mère du féminisme, la grande mère du MLF. So that, if you like, the once second wave feminism comes in the 1970s, she's kind of not safely home. She's reinterpreted in a different way. But uh, this is the, the area which in the first half of the 20th century is what I'm, uh, and what really, really interests me. Now, uh, I said I had pictures. One of the amazing things is how uh, our world has changed in terms of availability of sources. Now, you have lived up with, you've grown up with the, Internet and all it has to offer. When I was doing my thesis, I went to Rossi uh, Archive Centre, which had pieces of paper that people had, you know, uh, very um, sort of uh, lovingly kept, or uh, and, and there were it was really pure fluke that I could find anything at all. I'm having great fun in Gal on Gallica at the moment, which is a kind of the, the National Library, French National Library uh, electronic system, putting online a very obscure but very valuable periodicals. And uh, oh, yet Chauvet, I have the article that she wrote in 1936 where she's complaining that Marx has been given too much attention and that he's not to get, get more uh, attention for being the first to organize an international movement. I find a picture of her. I know what she looks like. And also, I find out that she's a poet and that she's a pacifist. And so I'm finding her profile and I'm finding other, uh, other things that she's written about. Um, so I think they, you know this is um, this is quite amazing. Um, the ac uh, the academic interest is, is um, I, I, I think I might skip that. How many for time? I think might, uh, the academic interest, if you like, uh, I suppose I could su you know this is a summary of it. Um, that the, for the you know the, the, I'm talking about the acolytes, the militants who were into the movement, who were into the movement, who were feminists to recognize that you know, from combined feminism and socialism. The first academic to do anything uh, this was a man called Jules Fresh. And he published his biography in 1925. Everybody, but everybody has to go by him because, of course, he was the holder of her diary and papers. Now, it's only kind of dawned on me about a year or two ago what the, if, that it, there might be an interesting angle to take on how he got interested in her and you know, question his whole background. And I've discovered a world of uh, socialist academics, who, some of whom are, are 
are, are loads of, but some of whom, a lot of whom are pacifists, are up before and after the First World War, um, a lot of whom are in favour of the suffrage. They're not militants, they're, they're not Marxists. So I'm finding a profile of these people who, are, on a Jew question, is so important in transmitting the biography of the Islam. And um, so she, uh, the, 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 the story of the non Marxist milieu, uh, the early socialists, anybody who's interested in the early socialists of this generation uh, would have been interested in. Uh, in Islam. And then, of course, it, 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 Jude Presh predates the growth of feminism. And what I find is that the, the, the feminine, if you like, if there's, if there's a trend to be followed, the feminist context of the 1970s uh, pushed growth into literary studies. I'm not complaining about literary studies, but the emphasis is on the text. I could go back to her titles and that's the context where she had she produced books, she produced few books. Uh, so the the, inter the close proximity of the text and the author, that's that's that can lead to uh, main interpretations, but I find that unsatisfactory and I think the context is the neglected part, it's the most complex part, and that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm get I'm, the the impact factor of Florence Tristan uh, of course is a message and I'm going to conclude with that. But the the, the my interest, in, uh, um, my interest is in the historical manner in which her ideas were condemned. I think that story hasn't been told yet. And only yesterday I was looking at all these uh, reviews. Of, I mean, the, the word search uh, facility, once you download a text, you can, you can actually see the words of the I found Le, uh, her citations of her in Le Nouveau Monde, no, La Revue du Monde Catholique. And there I've got an example of people who placed her as a dangerous woman who was all, all for, you know, attacking marriage. So it's, I, I, I yet, and very few people actually cite the text where Flora Tristan is quoted antagonistically. So you know, that's another trans kind of transmission. So I'm very excited. I'm very excited about Gallica and I'm very excited about Jules Presch, who's um, an amazing person. These are his dates. And again, you know, I worked on him for years. I visited the, where he, where his archives are held, and I've been given some wonderful leads uh, by a man who works on the First World War, Henry Casals, who produced, who edited a, a, the best book on the First World War, journal Carnet d'un Tournelier, a pacifist's diary of the First World War. You absolutely must read it if you, uh, if you can. And he had a wife who was equally prolific in. Uh, in, in academia, she went. She was trilingual. She she learned German. She went to Canada as a lecturer before she met. Uh, she, met she ran a, a, ref, a, 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 a an asylum for Jewish academics in the Second World War in her home in the south of France. So you know, if one person transmits one story, and you find there are many other stories. So again, uh, and she this person. Marie Louise is not the most prominent in uh, in French history books, and there there they are in there. Marie Blanc became a syn uh, synonymous with a refuge of uh, for for Jewish academics who um, uh, were encouraged. But and uh, this lady Marie Louise Presch also wrote to soldiers of the First World War. They ha they kept a huge correspondence. They they were devoted uh, to hi to history. Um, apparently their, their house was just full and full of, full of books. Um, uh, they left no direct descendants, so the, the, the papers are in a parlous state. Um, now, the reason why I'm sh I've got two, I'm going to finish with a couple of visuals, uh, just to remind me to tell you that, of course, correspondence is a tr transmission of ideas on paper, and correspondence is a fantastic source for tracing people's ideas and people's feet. I didn't know that Presh served in the First World War. He was conscripted, and he, uh, uh, so I photographed that in, uh, thanks to my digital camera, a digital camera. The, um, he, uh, he, he was part of the League of Nations support group uh, post-1919, post, uh, uh, post, uh, uh, and as were a lot of academics in, uh, in the early 20s. And I, so I thought that this, and of course this is a, a template, this is, uh, this is, you just fill in now, uh, um, who, who, so there he was in the uh, Président Compagnie, but um, 
he served for uh, uh, two or three years, I believe. So I'm really only uncovering his, his story. And the, uh, this is um, Capo Stale. Capo Stale, you just send text messages. stamp by of Pétain. And it's from one historian to another. And Bonny Blanc, that cast for town, is where this house was. And uh, Fresh had spent ha most of his winters in Paris, he was a typical academic, and would go to Bonny Blanc in the summer. And Bonny Blanc was where he went in 1940, and he never returned to Paris after that. But he still maintained a very strong correspondence. And he was the society uh, secretary to many societies. Uh, he, if, um, so he, he, he and his network, um, if you like, transmitted uh, Florent Tristan. Uh, Florent Tristan has become kind of, uh, she's sort of shrunk in importance, but I'm looking for traces of Florent Tristan. How many times does he mention her? He also did a biography of Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who is known for his misogyny, and so, you know, feminists are ag aghast when they see this person has. How come he wrote? A biography of these two people. Um, so, relevance to today, I've got two quotes. Uh, this is what Flora Tristan wrote about uh, why women should be involved in, uh, in uh, po politics and in, in uh, the working class movement that she proposed. Dans la vie des ouvriers, la femme est tout. Elle est leur unique providence. Tous les mots de la classe ouvrière se résolve par ces mots misère et ignorance, ignorance et misère or pour sortir de ce dédale je ne sais qu'un moyen commencer par instruire les femmes parce que les femmes sont chargées d'instruire les enfants mâles et femelles and what did I see in the Guardian on, in the week of International Women's Day this year teach a man to fish feed him for a lifetime teach a woman she should teach her friends start a business and pretty soon an entire village is on the so many thanks to Moira for that passionate run through the woman that she spent the last 30 years with. Um, do we have any questions either for Moira or, or, or for you? This is a slightly uh, a courtier, I suppose, in the sense that it's, that it's, it's looking at what Jens was saying about the, um, uh, the growth of the national identity of uh, Europe. Um, I, I uh, tried, to, tried to, um, to look more closely at what the topics were about today. I would have looked up a reference. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I didn't. I, like most people, perhaps I opened the, uh, the topics again when I got here. Um, when I was reading about um, aspects of sport and football in particular, um, I read, read an article some years ago now uh, about the influence of Uruguay's proficiency in football, in particular winning the uh, first World Cup in. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember correctly, 1930, which seems to be a very, um, very important date for Uruguay. Not only did Uruguay win the World Cup, I, I, I think again, I, I'm not it up, I think mean, it was held in Uruguay, and um, that in itself is a bit of a story as to why it should be held in Uruguay. Except that we found uh, the World Cup being uh, also organised by Mussolini and the Olympic Games being organised by Hitler and so on. So we have a feeling that um, sport and politics um, uh, are, have been intertwined for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder, yes, um, whether you have anything to, to add in terms of the, uh, the way that uh, sport, in particular football, was utilized, manipulated um, for purposes of creating, uh, and you gave the impression that there's certain artificiality in the creation of uh, Uruguayan national identity or in manipulation at least of certain elements of history in the way that the official version was fed to the, uh, the population. Any, any, any similar comment about sport in Uruguay? Yeah, <coughs> I mean, I said that 
cornerstone on the timescale, and I said 1915 because it was the end of the uh, administration of the second uh, presidential term of José Bachi Ordóñez, but his um, followers uh, continued to rule Uruguay until 1933, and even the dictatorship which followed then uh, was a bit of a continuation, and in this period 1915 to 1933 um, what was essentially a Colorado historiography was still uh, being challenged not the position of Artigas that was the only thing where Blancos or nationalists and Colorados agreed in they did not agree uh, with regard to the um, centenary of independence and that had to be decided so the Blancos um, were for 19 uh, 1825, so 1925, the centenary, um, a law had been passed in 1860 uh, by the Blanco Party, which said that should be the national holiday. Colorados wanted to rewrite history and actually, uh, in Parliament, um, uh, commissioned Pablo Acevedo to give an inform um, a, um, a report, and uh, this was not adopted. He failed. So no day was decided, and the celebrations of the centenary continued from 1925 to 1930 in a quite lackluster way, and uh, popular enthusiasm only kicked in when at the end, uh, in 1930, what? <laughs> yeah. uh, in 1930, when uh, the World Cup uh, took place in um, Montevideo, and uh, Uruguay actually won it, and I haven't um, I have actually a, a last slide on the Football World Cup, but I can't copy it at the moment. Um, um, I, I don't know actually um, how it was decided, um, but uh, I think from what I have gathered, the Colorado Party actually approached the Football Association to give it to them, um, also as a recognition of Uruguay's remarkable uh, stability in the early 20th century. After all, um, I said this first welfare state democracy, democracy is the first country in the world which made education free from primary school to PhD studies and is still today and there's a tradition in 2009 every school kid got a computer free of charge um, and if you compare that with other countries in Latin America it's remarkable it was the first country which let employers organization and, and workers negotiate directly without resorting to corporatism the first country which uh, nationalized key industries and services. And I could continue, it's really a remarkable development, and I think that was to be recognized internationally in a period when relatively few countries, at least in Latin America, had this stability. And yeah, uh, there were even discussions recently um, when they won again, um, reminding them of 1913. So it would be interesting to look into that. But yeah, it contributed to national identity. and. Um, the stadium itself is a kind of national monument until now there's a museum there and uh, it's not just about football it's about national identity and what has been achieved by then um, it, yeah I think I leave it here
it, there's no corroborate corroboration. She, the traveller, constructed her own story of seasickness for six weeks and all the rest, and the captain falling in love with her and various uh, interesting details. But her observation, it was her first major piece on uh, observation of her proving society work. Um, tantalizingly, she, we know she went by North America, but she was in some places. Uh, she traveled to London uh, in, as, um, as, as a, an experienced traveler and having produced her work in the uh, She traveled to London in the 1830s, uh, but we know that she traveled to London as an employee, that she saw London from, from, as an employee with probably a lady's companion, and that's the part she obliterates. Um, but she, when she travelled to London as an independent writer who had sort of was earning her income from her writings, she travelled as an observer and went to very inverted commas on the lady like places. She went into the slums, uh, so she must have had uh, you know, guides, escorts. She went into prisons, um, anywhere that she could. She went into those to write this observation. And we must remember she's contemporary probably in the very same thing that the English book in America after about six weeks stay. Uh, so then uh, she has a she by then she had formed a very strong opinions of the ch Catholic Church in how it exploited the poor and poor, very strong opinions about uh, capitalism, how she, she saw capitalism in the law, uh, and convinced that the French would never allow this kind of uh, this they would never be so submissive to exploitation. So when she set out on her trip around France, she was an experienced traveller and an observer. Of society, and she wrote uh, the draft of her diary is was planned work on uh, this, the, the current state of France, and that was the bit that was the But she had become, you know, quite adept at describing things. So she was France through and the uh, And of course, she, I should add, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that her first work was as a traveller. She wrote. As a woman traveller, her first kind of brochure was uh, on the need to welcome women travellers. And it necessitated her then a period of because she experienced the, you know, sort of the, the, the tensions and the, the unease and the discomfort of being able to travel. Sorry. Yeah, it wasn't meant to travel, but it's a little bit of a When you're saying about to go out and welcome her, you're the concept to take on and she travels it. I just wondered about how her idea the kind of the time, especially at the Parthenonian, and um, especially with the Parthenonian women after the name of the Lapa um, I wondered how her writings kind of went down with them. Yeah. Uh, well, again, we have uh, a, a, an incredible lack of evidence of her dialogue with the Sansimonian. We know, and there's, there are waves of movements, as you know, the Sansimonian uh, movement died out after about 1836. And as you know, then Jean de Rouen and Pauline Hollande became active in 1848, which of course we didn't see. But uh, she, we know that Florence attended San Simonian meetings. She declared in her Pamela Donald, her Je ne suis ni San Simonian, ni Pouliariste, ni Oliste. So she, you know, we know that she knows about it. She's very taken with the San Simonian idea of the, um, the woman Messiah. And I disagree with a lot of uh, feminist interpretations of uh, Princess Moses and the people uh, who, in you know, the 80s who say that she assumed the mantle of the woman Messiah and therefore that was her kind of feminism. Yes, she did, she writes about it in her diary, she had lamps in her diary, but she hadn't published her diary, that was in her own. So that's again very valuable. But she, um, the example of a woman leading humanity, she was very taken with that. Now, how much she was read is another mystery. We know that uh, some people, the, the, the reaction to her from her Don Walter was that this, what she was writing about Kenny that it was not very really like to write about. Um, she was considered to be too, uh, too difficult as a person um, to uh, forge links with, uh, with, with the Sansimony women's movement. But basically, there, there was no Sansimony movement by the time she she was going in France. It, it had, you know, Hong uh, Kong had gone to Egypt and it had, uh, it had vanished. And, th and things had got difficult for activists. 
So there's just that, the, even in the kind of communication of the first gen, it's like four years probably after the, you know, the but even the first kind of writing is there. Is there, 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 there is very little mention of it. There's very little mention of it. But that's, you know, so she kind of goes out of favor with, uh, with it's the workers who follow her, 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 her who construct her memory at her, 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 her gravesite. It's not women. So, you know, uh, and yet it's the, and then uh, when the feminist movement goes in the 1990s, it's the, uh, Ellen Leon the one we need to look at. She's in the book uh, that I did with Lisa uh, Gordon, she, the woman who was trying to pass it in 1917. She produced a brochure in 1919, totally outraged that Marx had all the other but for Helen Marion's book, is, uh, it's a brochure introducing uh, a lot of the most of works. So she had uh, access to the It's riddled with inaccuracies. Like she has Chazal killing her in Bordeaux, and she has her having only one child. And so it's, but in a way, that doesn't matter because, uh, well, it's supposed to be a bit But Helen Marion, a uh, feminist, pacifist, syndicalist, socialist, suffragist, is the one. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a thorny issue. Why the women didn't create any more in in her contemporary time? For Georges, I did I wrote a piece on her her correspondence to Georges Saint. Georges Saint had to be rather open. Different. What what influence do you think that the book by Vargas Llosa? writes two sort of parallel biographies yeah. of Gauguin and Flora Tristan may have in, I'm saying in yeah. academia, yeah. You know, but, but as far as I know, it's probably the only work which brings Flora Tristan to the large yeah. you know, the, the public. Um, the, there, ha, there have been a few, uh, there have been a few plays written about her um, in France. Um, which I presume were performed, but the, 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 one of the 1960s wonderful, uh, and, that, and, and a man called Nelson Gatton wrote a book called Gauguin's Astonishing Grandmother. Uh, uh, that was before the famous movement. But Vargas Rosa certainly is responsible for raising her profile, and especially since his book, uh, and well, it was Mahatma D. and Book Duma, The Way to Paradise in English. I don't know, it was first written in Spanish, so it's three languages. And he, transmitted because he had access in, in a way she never had. You know, he, famous author, he's now Nobel laureate, uh, he, he had access to publishing her and transmitting her ideas in a way that uh, you know, she never had, or, or many activists never had. But he missed, you know, for me, he missed transmits. He, he, um, he paraphrases her down with it. Um, and I don't think it's a very sympathetic, uh, well, I would say that. I don't think it's a sympathetic uh, approach to, uh, to her. Um, so, yeah, but he, um, he's been used. And there's a man called Stefan Michaud in France who is largely responsible for the editing of uh, the certainly had some of the correspondence. And Michaud got Douglas Lewis on board for the 2003 bicentenary uh, commemoration of the Irish Conference. Stefan Michaud didn't invite me or a person in Australia called Susan Brogan, who's, al who's also there. And again, this is a problem um, of transnational lack of communication. The, you know, a French person who work, who's, you know, is claimed by, you know, one national, within one national boundary. It's incredible the lack of dialogue. Um, but uh, and uh, anyway, this conference was on you know sort of a big, a big connection of the Vargas Rosa, and he says in this in the proceedings of the meeting, while well, I just wrote this book, so I wanted to. <laughs> he's not an academic. He's not. He wasn't trying to produce a history book. He just wrote a novel. And if you read the piece of the book which I'm doing now, it's exactly the same. It's two parallel stories, or two two per multiple personalities. I'm just I'm just told you Vargas Rosa. It's a technique, it's an authorial technique. Gauguin and Vargas Rosa never knew one another. Never. Go down you very little he, he, he very little bit. So but but Vargas Rosa is from is Peruvian yes. so that's the connection. Um, so he has in some way got something to talk about this, but he's not a historian, he's certainly not a feminist. Anyway, so
Yeah, you, the officialized version in this case of um, uh, independence, you need a national pantheon as part of national identity. Um, you want to have expressive symbols of the nation, um, a flag, uh, uh, anthem, uh, tell a story, um, inculcate that in school children. I mean, the issue is, of course, always how has it been perceived um, at the other end? I mean, what did... Uh, teachers make of these textbooks um, and um, and children and I mean um, it's probably the most difficult uh, question to ask because um, a textbook like a dictation is what the regime wants teachers to do uh, what they transmit officially um, but you would only find uh, say uh, some memories in Person memoirs or in, in, in letters, but uh, in a very scattered form. I mean, I looked at the um, um, official journal, the Annales de Educación, uh, the Instrucción uh, Primaria, um, where teachers contributed, but this didn't really divert much from the official uh, uh, vision. And, and the directors of the Institutos Normales de Montevideo, the uh, normal school or teacher training college uh, comes from the French Ecole Normale or the German uh, Lehrer uh, Seminar um, was of course a major m multiplier and the, the, these directors both of the male and the female institute completely stood behind the regime and uh, um, I haven't found anything in the case of uh, um, Uruguay I must say um, I just wrote an article on this national identity more generally and the journal also said I mean I know it's very difficult but if you make minor revisions or so w could you find something and I haven't yet um, of course um, as I said before it's with the Artiga story like with the other um, depictions of national identity it is always the Colorado version and, and that was disputed and they had their followers so say it was um, not contested by either side that the country was predominantly white. white. They were proud of that. Um, they had less problems um, silly, with um, the Afro-Uruguayan legacy, but especially with the Indian one. The Indian should not be part of the nation, as it was just after independence in many countries. I remind you of uh, Rebecca Earle's book, The Return of the Indian. At the end of the century, after Sarmiento? No. Um, but how they looked at different immigrants, different white immigrants, that was very different. The Basques settled more in the countryside, so became often the followers of the Blanco party, uh, while Neapolitans or the Catalan settled more in the cities, also uh, Gallegos, uh, Galicians. Uh, or um, if you have uh, uh, urban cosmopolitan, that was a Colorado uh, historiography. Of course, the Blancos would depict the country in a completely different way. They had a rural basis. So that was de debated, but not really, um, I mean, it, it contested from the other political contender, but not from from uh, pupils. Uh, but I think altogether one can say that Colorado's had um, it created a, a, a narrative that was accepted by, by a large part of the population. The country was proud of this pacification and this change, and the, the life of people really improved and uh, uh, Uruguay was better off than Argentina at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Richard, any other yeah, just, uh, it just occurred to me that uh, both that uh, both of you um, have reconstructed how past events are important to shape identities of communities later on, so in uh, Uruguay with your foundation and uh, 
the role of Robert Stone for the workers and feminist movement. And uh, you have called it a myth. Well, I mean, I, 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 I would probably, uh, you wouldn't say, uh, um, but I mean, uh, 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 is that, um, so in a way, the general question I'm asking is, is that what a myth is good for? Or, 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 um, this, this, yeah. Uh, um, well, I would, if I could answer first, I would say, well, there's a legacy. Mm. I think what, the reason why I want to look at this mm. myth making, if you mm. like, there's a process of myth, there's a process of uh, a famous person, mm. famous, I mean, he wasn't famous at the time, but he becomes famous only posthumously, mm. his works are yeah. uh, recognized. Um, and therefore, I'm going to get in the Gauguin and rise is important in the trails after mm -hmm. Christian, or through how Christian rises out of the feminist kind mm -hmm. of construction of history, because fem the second year feminists mm -hmm. discover history. And she pulls up with her, uh, and this is what my interest is, she pulls up with her own obscure <coughs> socialists who have been in Canada. So it's resurrection, it's kind of resurrection of the past. Um, it's, it's trying to just, well, I suppose, separate out what is a myth, where is a myth, how is a myth created? How, how, does it, how does a legacy happen? And um, uh, and how how can you what can you transmit with first of all yeah what can you transmit with in transmitting for a Christian's ideas what are you transmitting and how is it transmitted? And I so, and my take is me more across with my you know preconceived notions and uh, and my and my turn in the next future and I don't know what people will make of it a hundred years time. <laughs> Century of, uh, but uh, that's my answer. Yeah, I, th I, th I hope I've shown. I mean, after a hundred years of constant civil wars, internal conflicts, armed party political conflicts, with as I said, internal external fronts overlapping, uh, stability was extremely important and. Uh, Therefore, you need certain values, uh, certain images of the nation, uh, which might be shared by most. Uh, and uh, whenever you have a real or perceived external enemy, then that can also uh, forge uh, nation building. And Argentina and Brazil were the two most powerful neighbors. And it is very, very interesting to look at the of, at both Varela's uh, um, correspondence and speeches. Um, um, whenever a country was well off, it called itself somehow the Switzerland of Latin America. You see it for uh, um, the Republica Modelo, Chile, uh, for Costa Rica now, um, um, Uruguay, same, the Switzerland of Latin America. But they defined it uh, more geostrategically or geopolitically. What did Switzerland do to gain this uh, prosperity? It was like Uruguay. Um, surrounded by two powerful neighbors, France and Germany. We have to uh, pursue happiness. We have to have a better living standard, a better education than the neighbors. So um, they wanted to invest in that. Um, Jacobo Barella uh, said, I mean, uh, what did Alexander II do immediately after the Crimean War? Rebuild the schools in Russia. Um, uh, why had Germany won in the German-Austrian War uh, in 1866 because Germany had better schools and so it was a, a, a major um, motivator and, and, and the Colorados wanted to rewrite history uh, and had, uh, Uruguay had stability for six, seven decades then suddenly even Uruguay um, had a military dictatorship from eight, 1970 two I think was uh, um, and nowadays again independence is discussed um, to sort of somehow revitalize this um, um, myth of a very or, or not myth this this prosperous past and uh, um, see education as part of the redemocratization process and I think it will always be discussed after decisive ruptures in the national history.
we can discuss over tea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody for your questions and thank you very much indeed of course to our two speakers. I missed the word collective project. We revitalized the collective project, so it was <coughs> Well, what have you done to the company? We'll leave that to the 